There are words we use every day, and we don't give them much thought. Take shalom, for instance. We all know what shalom means. If you ask a man, what is shalom? He will say, you know, it means peace. But common words like shalom and peace, while we know what they mean, are hard to pin down to just one simple idea. According to Strong's Concordance, the word shalom has a very wide range of meaning from peace to completeness, wholeness, health, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, and the absence of agitation or discord. With such a wide range of meaning, it begs the question, what underlying concept ties all of these ideas together? In the hit TV series Star Trek, the character Spock would often give the greeting, live long and prosper, and other characters might reply, peace and long life. These greetings seem to represent and suggest the same idea as the term shalom. When a man and his family have shalom, they have peace and prosperity, living during a time when there is no war, free from disturbance, and blessed with lots of children and grandchildren, lots of healthy farm animals, and a bounty of healthy crops free of disease and insect damage. Such a man was Job, before his adversary Satan took away his peace and prosperity. The book of Job describes him as a blameless man, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. He was living in Shalom, having seven sons and three daughters, and his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And according to the scriptures, that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And as the account progresses, we witness Job's response to a time when, at first, his prosperity was taken away, but also his health was also taken. He was sick and in pain, and the only thing Satan didn't take from Job was his life and his integrity. The one idea that sustained Job during his trouble was the idea that God was good and that he was in complete control. Though his wife hated to see her husband suffering, even suggesting that he take his own life to end the pain, he tells her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. At the end of the book of Job, we see that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. And in turn, Job had many more sons and daughters, and he blessed them also, even giving his daughters an inheritance among their brothers. Job lived another 140 years after his adversity, and he saw four generations of his son and daughters, and he died an old man full of days. We see from this that peace and long life, shalom, is a blessing and ultimately a manifestation of God's grace. And since God is the source of peace and long life, then it behooves us to make peace with him. Job lived a long time and he was prosperous, but whether he prospered or not, he never lost his integrity. He always maintained his respect for God and he never lost his perspective concerning his relation to God. According to the sacred writings of the Hebrews, God promises shalom for his people, which in time will be a perfect peace Free from enemy attack, yes, but also free from the possibility of enemy attack. The oracles of God speak about a coming age of shalom when Israel, being rescued from the hand of her enemies, will forever serve him in holiness and righteousness without fear. Perfect shalom carries with it a sense of permanence, having a stability and durability that lasts in perpetuity. The concept of shalom is a recurrent theme throughout the Bible, even the New Testament. One example comes from Luke's Gospel, which records the birth of John the Baptist. Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were having difficulty conceiving a baby, and so during the performance of his priestly duties, he prayed to God for a child. Startled by the appearance of the angel Gabriel, he listened as Gabriel relayed the message that his wife Elizabeth would bear him a son which would bring the couple joy and gladness, because not only will John be a man of good character, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. 
His mission will be to turn the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God and serve as the forerunner of the coming Messiah, making the people ready for the Lord. After John was born and Zacharias is given back his voice, the first thing out of his mouth was a blessing. We read part of the prayer beginning in Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of David his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. Zacharias not only prays that God would rescue Israel from the hand of her enemies, but that Israel might serve God without fear. And here, Zacharias adds to our understanding of Shalom. Without question, before Israel can have peace from her enemies, she must make peace with her God. The way to peace with God is the restoration of friendly relations through atonement or propitiation. What will it take to appease God and assuage his anger, avoid his wrath, and return to a time of blessing and shalom? What are the terms of peace? What does God want? Paul the Apostle gives us the good news. God has set the terms of peace and provided for himself the conditions agreeable for the establishment of harmonious relations between himself and those who fear him. In the third chapter of Romans, he argues that although all have sinned, reconciliation with God is also a manifestation of his grace. Peace with God has been established through the cross of Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. God himself provided the means of reconciliation for all who want it. In Romans chapter 5, Paul fills out more of the details. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. To live long and prosper is a gift of God's grace, which friends would normally grant to each other, but God, while we remained his enemies, satisfied the conditions for peace himself through the death of Jesus on the cross. And having provided human beings with the means to become right with God, he is free to grant us eternal life. Peace is offered to those who sue for peace with repentance, contrition, humbleness, a love for the truth, and a plea for forgiveness. As Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Make peace with God, and he will forgive. What about peace with other people? One way to have peace is to live as a hermit in isolation, secluded from society. Anyone can find peace and harmony by avoiding other people altogether. After all, Discord requires at least two people, but perfect shalom takes place when two or more people live together without discord, which implies that shalom has a moral and ethical component. To the degree that it is up to me, the Bible exhorts me to live in peace with other people. Live in peace with one another, Paul writes. I can easily hear myself say, wouldn't it be great if God would eliminate all of my enemies? Then I could live in peace. But I can also hear Jesus tell me, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God will indeed rescue Israel from the hand of her enemies, so that they might serve him without fear. Nonetheless, in order for Israel to find perfect peace, each individual Israelite must repent, humble himself or herself, treat one another with respect and dignity, and learn to serve each other. God says through Isaiah, The work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness quietness and confidence forever. Then, then my people will live in a peaceful habitation, and in secure dwellings, and in undisturbed resting places. The age of Shalom is the age of righteousness. The work of righteousness is peace, and presumably, without righteousness, there can be no peace. The service of righteousness, he says, brings about quietness and confidence, and only then will the people live in peaceful habitation. And here we see another aspect of Shalom, quietness and confidence. Not only does Shalom include reconciliation with both God and man, it also refers to inner peace. Not only does shalom speak about human flourishing and well-being, it ultimately includes human fulfillment. And in order for a man or a woman to live a fulfilling life, one must understand what it means to be a human being and attempt to be the best human being possible. The Bible gives the raison d'etre for mankind in terms of his being created in God's image. Man owes his existence to God, who created man in his image, and so it follows from this that in order to lead a fulfilling life, one will do well to be the best image of God possible. To image God is to imitate Him, trying to excel in godly virtues. Biblical fulfillment is the highest good of man defined in terms of God's ethical and moral values, and so moral character is essential and necessary for happiness and shalom. In addition, however, the Bible doesn't often speak in the abstract tending to focus issues down to specific people living in specific places during specific times. Human fulfillment is better understood with respect to the individual, including the teleological aspect of each individual's personal history. Biblical fulfillment asks, Why did God create me, and how best can I live according to his purpose for me? This might look different for each individual, as each person lives out the role, the mission, the story that God has created for them. In the next video, Dr. John A. Crabtree will teach us more about the Age of Shalom, and I encourage you to watch that video after you watch this one. In conclusion, though, I want to quote from his paper, The Miracle of Safar Sunni. I'll leave a link to his paper in the video description. One begins to have Safar Sunni when he faces squarely into the existential question, Am I willing to be who God made me to be? And answers it wisely. That is not an easy thing to do. To come to the sort of submissive trust in God that can say, yes, I am willing to be who God made me to be, or yes, it is all right that I have the life that God has given me, can be agonizingly difficult. But once we break through that spiritual barrier, once we can, from the depths of our being, say yes, we have swallowed some of the strongest medicine in the world. Not only have we sealed the reality of our sanctification, but we have set in motion a spiritual virtue which will wipe self-hatred and all its ugly symptoms out of our lives. We have set into motion the miracle of Safrasune. As it was said earlier, shalom is an act of God's grace. Perfect peace not only involves rescue from our enemies, it involves God's miracle transformation of my mind and my heart giving me quietness of soul, humility, knowing myself, and living in accordance with the role and destiny God has allotted to me. Thank you for watching.